Hello everyone, it's Guy. I'm back. We talked earlier about this prayer that the Lord taught the priest to pray over the people. It's important because it is not the request of people to God, but it is God teaching priests how to pray. Let's go through it again. Numbers 6.22. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You can see in this prayer, it's all the Lord doing. Lord bless, the Lord make his face. The Lord be gracious, the Lord give you peace. This is the desire of God, and that's why he taught the priest to pray in this way over the people. If we asked it of God, we knew that God would answer the prayer. That would solve a lot of problems already by itself, because if God's gonna bless us and keep us and make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us and give us shalom, wow, that covers up almost everything. Yet, this is the prayer from God teaching the priest to pray over us. So we know that if we ever pray this prayer, we're simply agreeing with God and say, yes, God, I love your prayer. I want everything that you say that you want to give to me. I want it. I want you to keep me. I want you to bless me. I want you to have your face shine upon me. I want you to be gracious to me. And I want you to give me shalom, peace. And as we learned earlier, shalom is very important because it means completeness, wholeness, lacking nothing, tranquility, quietness, contentment, welfare, health, prosperity, lacking nothing. That is shalom. If we have shalom of God, it means we are well balanced. We are well provided for. We are in good health and we're strong. That is really amazing. And we find this in the prayer that God taught the priest to pray over the people. So we know it is God's desire to give it to us. We know it's God's will. And when we pray this prayer, we are simply coming to agreement with what God's will is. As we spoke about earlier also in John 14, 27, Jesus, before going to the cross, said, Shalom, peace, I leave with you. My shalom, my peace, I leave with you. And that my shalom, that's the shalom of Jesus, the completeness, wholeness, health, strength of Jesus, he's giving to us. Not as the world gives, but he gives it to us. Freely, it's free, it's a gift. Why is it a gift? Because if we go back to number 622, the third verse, uh, verse 25 says, the Lord be gracious to you. I want to draw this, your attention to this word, be gracious to you. God wants to be gracious to us. Grace, if you look up any lexicon, it means it is the unearned, undeserved favor of God upon us. God wants to give us what is unearned and undeserved. It's a gift, you can't work for it. And that's the God's plan. In Romans 11, 6, it says, And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would be no longer grace. You see, grace cannot be based on works because if it's something we work for, then it's a reward. Grace is not a reward, it's a gift. It's very important. Now we know that the shalom of God comes by this grace because uh, Numbers 6.22. I'd like to read to you 2 Timothy 1.9. Some people think, oh, you know, if man just didn't sin, if we just didn't sin, if Adam didn't sin, if we didn't sin, wow, you know, we'd be totally blessed. It's true, if sin didn't enter, we'd be blessed. But let me show you this. Grace actually pre-existed even the original sin of man. Adam in Garden of Eden. In 2 Timothy 1.9, it says, he has saved us, and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus from before the beginning of time. So even before the creation of the world, grace already pre-existed, waiting to be manifest. This is God's heart. God's heart is a heart of grace. Even before rebellion and sin, grace already was in Jesus waiting before the foundation of the earth before time began, waiting, waiting. This is the heart of God. And that's why it's found in number 622. This is why grace is the answer. Grace qualifies the worst of us for the miracles that we need. Grace qualifies us even when we cause our own problems. Grace still is able to manifest and come in and change our lives, change us upside down. We read earlier in John 3 where it says, Beloved, I desire about all things that you prosper and be in health just as your soul, inside person, prospers. Prosper inside. Hear how much God loves you. Hear how much God wants you well. Hear how much God wants to give you His shalom. Know it is the God's will for you. And as you hear it, you smile. Wow, that's unbelievable. I can't believe it. I thought I had to work for all these things. I had to, thought I had to deserve all these things. It's given by grace. Grace is undeserved and unmerited. Favor of God. I can't earn it. I just have to believe and receive it. Galatians 5.4 says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. I know many people think falling from grace means, oh, if you sin, you did this wrong or that wrong, you fall from grace. Actually, it's the opposite. Whoever of you are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. In trying to be obedient and meet all the requirements of the law, 
that action makes us fall from grace because we try to qualify for the miracles of God by our right performance rather than receive from God what is a free gift because he wants to give it to us by undeserved and unmerited favor as a gift. So a gift is in direct opposition to works. You cannot put the two side by side. That's why Romans 11, 6 again, if by grace, then it cannot be by works. If it were by works, grace would no longer be grace. Grace cannot coexist with works. What does it mean? Does it mean we don't have to obey? We just do whatever we want and God's gonna love us and, and pour out his healing on us? No, here's what we need to see. It's just not quite what you think it is. Romans 10, 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. We have to obey the gospel. It didn't say obey the law and do the things of the law. Obey the good news, the gospel. What does the obedience to the gospel mean? It says, Isaiah, for it says, Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? You see, Obeying the gospel is believing the report of God. That's it. That is obedience to the gospel. It sounds really easy. It's not that easy because you'll find that it's a lot easier to do things than it is to believe things. But when you believe, it changes the world upside down. And this is what God wants you to believe. Because this Romans 10, 16 is quoting from Isaiah 53, which we read in a prior session. Isaiah 53, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So here, Isaiah 53 is a report of God. I'm just going to fast forward to the next paragraph here. It says, Jesus is despised and rejected by men, and he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. It says grief in most English translations, but in some it says diseases, and in the Hebrew it's koli, which means diseases. And it says in the next two verses down, it says, surely, he has borne our koli, griefs. He's borne our griefs, but koli means diseases. So Jesus bore our diseases when he did it on the cross. If he bore our diseases on the cross, then the diseases have no business being on us here. It's been taken over there. That's why belief, belief. When we see a manifestation of a sickness or disease in us or around us, now is the time to believe. Believe the word of God. It says, Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with disease. Wait, if he was, then how can it be here? Something is wrong. I believe. I believe. And so, according to the word of God, this disease that I see now must leave. It's trespassing. Surely he has borne our disease. Surely, not maybe, surely. The chastisement for our shalom, wholeness, completeness, and health, was put on upon Jesus. So we have it all here in Isaiah 53. Either God is playing with us or it's a truth. Of course it's a truth. Of course it's the truth. Matthew 8, 17, talking about healing, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying himself took our infirmities and bore our diseases. It's there. So we have this black and white guarantee from God that he's taken away our sicknesses and diseases. And he doesn't want us to bear them because he has borne them. So this disease and sickness cannot be in two places. It's either on Jesus or it's on us. So since it's on him, then what we see on us cannot remain. It must depart when we believe. So we believe God like Abraham believed, and we ask God to manifest his miracles in us and take away the things which are now trespassing, the finished work of Jesus, and that we are delivered. And so we can have this shalom. We have the shalom of Jesus himself. In John 6, 28, I just want to close the loop on this idea of works and grace because the people were also confused during the time of Jesus. They went to Jesus and said, what must we do that we might work the works of God? They wanted to work the works of God. And Jesus answered, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one whom he has sent. So when we believe God and his goodness and his word of grace to us, then that work, that believing is works, and that is obedience to the gospel. And as we obey this gospel of God, our lives get transformed 180 degrees inside out. We prosper on the inside, we prosper on the outside. We're healthy on the inside, we're healthy on the outside. Shalom and shalom.